Welcome to Grace this morning. If you guys are new here, welcome. My name is Jeff, my amazing wife and I. We are the youth pastors here at Grace, and I also get the privilege of being part of the teaching team where I get to share a message about once a month, and it's my Sunday. So we're going to be looking at the, yay, we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Judges. This is going to be our second week in the book of Judges. Um, and so I want to do just a little recap because uh, really to dive into Judges, you have to kind of know at least some about Joshua, which we did several months ago, uh, and then we felt like God was leading us to go through the book of Revelation. And so we did a, a long stint in the book of Revelation, which was a wonderful study. Do you, you got, did you guys enjoy it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a great study. It was a, it was a study I hadn't really kind of went through like that, and so uh, it, was, it was really eye-opening. But uh, to dive into Judges, we have to know at least a little bit of where, uh, where Israel's at and, and what Israel's going through. And so uh, this is at the time when Israel has just entered into the Promised Land. Um, if you remember way back, there was a man named Moses. Uh, Moses was an Israelite, but he was raised in Pharaoh's household uh, because of the, the ordination of God. Um, he was raised in Pharaoh's household, and the Israelites were enslaved to Egypt at this time. And so God used Moses to free the people from Egypt and was leading them into what is known as the promised land. This is the land that God has promised to the children of Israel. Um, and so he did is a 40-year journey through the wilderness as they kind of walk in circles, basically, for 40 years. And as they come up on to uh, the, the, the border of the promised land, Moses dies. And his predecessor, a man named Joshua, takes over. And this man, Joshua, leads the children of Israel into the promised land. Now, the book of Judges picks up with the death of Joshua. So where they're at right now is they are now in the promised land, but their fearless leader, Joshua, has died. And now the children of Israel are kind of left there uh, without a, a full ruling leader at this point. And this is where we get the judges. Uh, so the judges are the the leaders of Israel at this time. And so um, at this point, they had no kings. Um, they were actually supposed to be what, what scholars would call a theocracy, which is a, uh, a government that has God at the center. However, as we'll see with the Israelites, they simply did not take God seriously, and they did not respect his word. And so over and over, they failed to keep God at the center of their governing body. And so God would raise up judges or, or deliverers. Now, don't think judge like, you know, black robe and gavel, guilty type of judge. This is uh, a phrase that is used to represent these leaders, but it is, um, there are more political or military leaders. And as we'll see, uh, military is uh, one of the common traits we see is that they are warriors. Um, and so that, that is what we're going to be looking at. When we're looking at judges, we're going to be looking at several of the judges as we go through. Today, specifically, we're going to be in Judges 3. Uh, so if you want to open your Bibles, you can, or we'll have it on the back wall or on the fancy app. Um, and so you, we're going to be in Judges 3, we're going to be covering three different judges. But we're also going to be covering what I feel like is a little bit of an overlooked category when we look at the book of Judges, and that is the children of Israel. We want to look at the heroes, but so often we don't look at the people, the, the bystanders, if you will. Because a lot of times, I don't know about you guys, but I'll read the Bible and I put myself in the shoes of the hero. Like David versus Goliath, I'm definitely David. <laughs> right? Absolutely, every time. No, I'm like one of the Israelites that's like cowering away from this giant. It's like, don't kill me. And then like whenever God shows up, then they kind of run and fight. And, and so I want to look at the bystanders too, that's the, the people that are there alongside the judges. So let's pray, and then we will dive into today's message. Father, thank you so much for everything you do. Father, thank you for this day and just bringing each and every person here. God, I know it's no coincidence. It's no accident. Uh, the people that are here today are here, Father, and I just pray right now, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would open our ears, you would open our hearts, God, that we would hear your message, your truth, what you want to say to us today, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would speak through me, God, that it would not be my words that are heard, but it would be your word and your truth that is heard and understood here today. Father, I just pray for you to be in this place. I pray that you'd be with us. You, you know the struggles, the, the fights that we're all facing, Lord. And I just pray right now that everyone would be encouraged and they would be open to hearing your word, Lord. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, as we, we, we jump in, I want to I share a, a little bit of a story as an example. How many people here like board games? Not, not as many as I expected. Okay. All right. Um, you guys have played Monopoly too many times. I think it's the problem. <laughs> Listen, no one likes the guy that builds a hotel on Boardwalk. I get it. All right. Don't let that scar you from every board game. Um, I personally, I love just games in general, okay? 
Um, and I love board games. I grew up playing board games with my parents. Uh, my mom was a, a huge Scrabble addict and a huge Yahtzee addict. Like, we played Yahtzee every night. Yahtzee's amazing. Um, Yahtzee, I, so okay, my mom was really good at Yahtzee, and I have no idea how. I don't get, I don't get how you can be good at this game, because uh, it's, it's, it's luck-based, but it's, she was so good at it, I still have some of her scorecards from when we, when we played, and I still can't beat her scores. Still today, I can't, I, I don't know. I think she cheated, I don't know. But anyway, I know I certainly did, and I still didn't win, so <laughs> here we are. Uh, but I grew up playing Yahtzee, Monopoly, games like that with my mom. Then I would play games like chess and poker with my dad. So I, I grew up playing just all these kind of games. And, and one of the things that I, I, I vividly remember is I could never win, right? Like, I mean, I just remember being like, I was just, I was a brat too. I was that kid that like you, I would land on your property and I would get mad and throw the board and like rock, walk away. I was that, you didn't want to play games with me back then. Um, and, and I, but I remember my parents never let me win. And this is something I've seen as I've become an adult is like adults let kids win. Don't do that. You're setting them up for failure, okay? Let's just be real for a minute. I don't let my kids win. I'll just, I'll, we'll start with that. I don't let my kids win. And if I play games with your kids, I'm not going to let them win either. Just, just quick heads up. <laughs> and we do board game nights with the youth. I don't let them win either. You're going to beat me, you're going to beat me, all right? And so I, 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 that's just kind of where I'm at because at some point, your child is going to realize one of two things. Either all this time you've been letting them win or you're very bad at this game neither of which is going to help their self-esteem. So it's better to go ahead and beat them and give them something to work toward. I should, it should also be noted, I'm just one of those people that doesn't like participation trophies either. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Like, if you're awarded for everything, you don't have to work for anything. And so it's kind of killing. Like, I, when we get participation trophies, we throw those out. That doesn't count. you got to win. I, I'm, I'm sorry. And this is coming, listen, it's not because, like, I grew up playing for CCHS and we won everything. I've never been on a winning team my entire life. I don't know what that says about me, but I don't want a trophy I didn't earn, okay? And so I think that we are doing our kids a great disservice when we don't beat them. Now, listen, I'm not saying play full contact football with a six-year-old, all right? That's, that's a little extreme, but if you're playing a game, make them work for it. Give them something to earn. Give them something to accomplish. Don't just let them win. We've got to be setting our kids up better for life. Because eventually, they're going to go into the real world, and the real world's not going to let them win, right? And I hope at this point you can see we're not just talking about board games anymore. we got to be setting our children up for the real world. we got to be setting our children up for a world that's not going to take it easy on them, that they're going to have to work for the win. They're going to have to work to survive. Right now, we're teaching London, um, she's six, my six-year-old, we're teaching her uh, about finances. And so she gets an allowance for doing chores. She doesn't do chores, she doesn't get an allowance. That's how the world works. You don't show up to work, they don't pay you anymore. It's kind of how it goes. You do the job badly, they don't pay you. And so she gets an allowance for doing chores. Now, when she gets her allowance, the first 10% goes to God, she tithes. The second 10% goes to charity. She's blessed, bless others. And the last 10% goes to savings. She's saving, I don't know what for, but she's saving it. We're teaching her to handle finances now because we know that when she gets bigger, if she learns how to handle it now, it'll be easier when she has more of it. We're teaching her for the world. We're, we're setting her up, trying to set her up for success. And a loving father, a loving parent will always set their children up for success even when it doesn't feel good. Right? When you love your children, you will test them and you will prepare them and you will set them up for success even when they don't like it. My daughter does not like giving up 30% of her weekly allowance but it is setting her up for success. We're going to see in just a moment as we dive into Judges 3 that God does the same thing with his children. He will test you, and he will prepare you, and he will get you ready because he's trying to set you up for success. And the choice is ultimately yours, what you're going to follow and what you're going to do with those tests. But God absolutely tests his children. We see this throughout Scripture. We're going to see that here today with Judges 3, with the children of Israel. He tests them and he sets them up for success. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to read um, verses 1 through 4, and then we'll talk about them for a moment. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. 
He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the, uh, of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites, le- living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount ba- Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath. For the record, guys, I'm going to mispronounce these, but I'm going to do it with confidence, okay? So you're never going to know is the goal here. They were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's command, which he, sh- which he had given their ancestors through Moses. So the command was this. When you enter into the promised land... Get rid of all the other nations. It's pretty straightforward. It's repeated several times through Moses, through Joshua. When you enter into the promised land, get rid of all the other nations. This is why we've seen the great battle of Jericho where they, they walked around the, the walls of Jericho seven times. The walls came crumbling down. They beat up Jericho. They, you know, where we see all these big war stories that happen in Scripture is because they were supposed to go and eradicate all the people from the land. Now, you may go, well, that's incredibly cruel. You're just going to walk into someone's land, beat them up, take it from them. Well, yeah, when you put it like that, it doesn't sound good. You shouldn't put it like that, guys. So what was going on is God knew what would happen to his children if he allowed these outside influences to come to them. So there were, there were groups that were incredibly evil, that had evil practices like the Canaanites that, that believed in child sacrifice to please all of their various deities. And so they would sacrifice children. And God knew that there were all these different groups that would, would push their evil and influence his children And so he said, when you enter into this promised land, you are to eradicate them, to get them out of there so that you're no longer influenced by them. Let's just see how well they followed these instructions. Judges 121. The Benjamites did not drive out the Jebusites. That's just just one. Judges 127. Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shean or Tanakh or Dor or Ibleam or Megiddo. Just a couple, guys. Don't worry about that. Verse 28, they did not force out the Canaanites. 30, Zebulun didn't drive out the Canaanites in Chitron or Nahal. Verse 31, Asher didn't drive out the, those in Akko, Sidon, Alab, Azib, Helba. Do y'all get it? They didn't listen to God. They didn't obey the commands that God had given them. He set before them a very simple set of rules. Get the people out before you settle down. They refused to do so. They, they blatantly disobeyed God. They blatantly disobeyed God, and yet it still seems like God has a plan despite their disobedience. He has a plan to use their disobedience. He has a plan to use their brokenness, which is, which is interesting because I think a lot of times we think of our life like this like linear path, right? We think of God's plan for our life like this linear path, and like when I'm doing all the right things... Right when I'm like reading the Bible and I'm like I'm praying and I'm like checking in on Granny and like when I'm just doing all the right things, I'm walking this straight line, right? And I'm I'm walking and I'm following God's plan. But every once in a while, me not you guys, but every once in a while, I get off track a little bit and I, I start to deviate from the plan that God has for me. I get to, I start to deviate from the the from the purposes. For the things that God's calling me to do, I start to deviate and I get off track and I end up over here in the middle of nowhere and I'm like, I don't know how I got here. Well, I do. I walked by making all the wrong decisions. I I walked away from God is a fancy Christian term. I walked away from God and we think that we've moved off this place and then eventually, some of us, it's it's days, some weeks, some, some years, some of us are still over here wondering what in the world's going on. We've deviated from God's plan. And so we think that God shows up whenever we finally pray and we cry out and we repent of all the terrible things we've done. And God says, okay, that's okay. Come on over here with me. Let's get back to your plan and and, and we'll just walk this nice linear line once again. And what we think is that God just completely disregards all of our brokenness. And I think if we think that God can't use our brokenness, we're undermining how mighty he is. Because God doesn't come get you and bring you back to perfection and now that you're over here and you're all good and tidy again I can use you no God says where you are in the midst of your brokenness in the midst of your rebellion in the midst of your obedience I'll use you and I will use the story that you've created I will use your weakness for my glory no believe me look at the look at the story of Jonah Jonah had very simple instructions go tell the people of Nineveh to repent Jonah's like about that I don't want to and so then He begins to run away from God and from Nineveh. He gets in a boat literally heading in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He's trying to run away as fast and quickly as he can. Doesn't work. It's hard to run from God. And so he gets thrown overboard, swallowed up by a fish, and swam back to Nineveh. 
gets spit out on the shore. What's God doing? God's using his disobedience. Because guess what? The people in Nineveh, surprisingly so, happen to be very religious. In fact, they worship Dagon. He was known as the fish god. He was believed to be half man, half fish, and the parts swapped. It's really odd. It seems very insufficient to have the top or the bottom of a man and the top of a fish, but whatever. Whenever a man was spit up on the shores of Nineveh, Nineveh from a fish to these people that worship the fish god, it caught their attention. This caught their attention. And so Jonah gets out, mad still, and he's like, repent. And they're like, okay. And he's like, oh, that worked. The entire nation of Nineveh repents and turns to Yahweh, turns to God. God will absolutely use your brokenness. God will use your rebellion. God will use your story. God will use your imperfection. God will use your temptations. He will use every part of your life if you'll give it up to him. Don't think that you're over here and like God's got to get you back to perfection. I got to read the Bible more and I got to pray more. I got to get these tattoos covered up. I got to quit drinking. I got to quit looking at that. God doesn't want anything to do with me when I'm in the midst of this. No, no, God's going to use that to propel you forward. He's going to come to you in the midst of your brokenness. He's going to come to you in the midst of your sin. It may not be popular amongst Christians. I'll admit, let's be honest, we can be judgmental. And there may be some people who are like, God shouldn't use him. That's exactly who God's going to use. Have you ever read the Bible? See the people he chose? God uses the least expected person. God uses and chooses the unchosen. God goes, it says specifically, I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but God specifically says he looks at the heart, whereas man looks at the outside appearance. You're never too far gone for God to use you. And God has a plan and he's a purpose and he's ready to work with you through it right now, right where you are. You don't have to turn perfect. You don't have to clean up every part of your life. You don't have to have it all together. God will use you. I am a prime example of what God can do with a simple yes. I, uh, this wasn't my plan. I went to school for IT. I wanted to fix computers. My worst fear in the world was public speaking. And then I get saved, and God's like, you're going to talk. And I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> he insisted. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what God can do with your yes. But so, so often we spend so much time running away from God, trying to say no, trying to avoid the awkward, trying to avoid what we think we're not meant to do because we don't think we're good enough, we don't think we're qualified, we don't think we have what it takes. And we're right. We don't. But he does. And he can do incredible things even in the midst of your brokenness. My Bible says in Romans 8, 28, also this message is called Relentless Grace. The Bible also says in Romans 8, 28, I always forget that slide. I don't even know why I put it in there anymore. <laughs> and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Did you notice that? God will only use the good things. No, no, my Bible says that he'll use all things. It says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and been called according to his purpose. And so the brokenness, the stuff you don't want anyone else to know about, the stuff that you don't want to bring into church, God knows. And God can do incredible things through it. Turn it over to him. We see the Israelites here. They failed to obey God. God is absolutely going to use this brokenness. But first, let's look at what happened as a direct result of them failing to obey God. Verse 5. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And I promised myself I would not make the termite joke. <sighs> took a lot of restraint there. All right. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. That's not good, friends. You see, God knew what would happen if they allowed these people to stay in their land. He knew the outcome. And this is exactly what he knew would happen. They intermarried with them, and they began to serve their gods, and they began to forsake their God. It says right here in verse 7, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan, Rishimathiam, or something, king of Aram, Nahariam. I actually pronounced that name a lot, and I still butchered it, so that was the best you could get, guys to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. What a drastic turn of events. Who would have thought that a simple act of defiance against God would lead you into 
obvious sin of worshiping the gods of the world. Shocking. It's almost like we didn't expect that to happen. The same thing still happens today. Let's not read this like it's some foreign concept. Like there aren't Christians that show up on Sunday morning and go out and worship the gods of the world. There are Christians that show up in churches all over the country every Sunday and go right back out and care only about money and women and men. We still worship the gods of this world. Let's not pretend this is such a foreign concept. But God's calling us to be better than that. God's calling us to be greater than that. God sets before us a set of instructions like he set before the children of Israel. The children of Israel had it pretty easy. Walk in the promised land, get all the other people out. They failed to do so. We have a set of instructions. We call it the Bible. People don't like to think of this as an instructional book either. They're like, that's legalistic. I don't want to do that. Let's think about that for a second. We have instructions in this book. Things like, uh, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. So go to church. Wake up in the morning and, and pray to God. So prayer, his light will be a lamp unto our feet. Study his word. Take care of the orphans and the widows. Be the hands and feet of Christ. Serve the church. Give joyfully to the Lord. Give get charitably. We have instructions. Absolutely, this is an instructional book. Now, we can look at this and say, hey, that's incredibly legalistic for God to tell me what to do with my life. This is my life. I could do with it what I want. You absolutely can. You absolutely can. You have complete and utter free will. I believe that. You can do whatever you want. Now, the question is, should you do whatever you want? Think of for, let's go into an example for a second. Imagine, how many in here have uh, successfully killed a plant? Successfully killed the plant. Yeah, I'm not asking if you can grow anything. I failed that one too. Um, excellent. We're doing great. Have you ever went uh, and bought like a flower? It comes in those little crunchy pods. You know, no, I'm talking about the little crunchy pod things. All right, some of us have. Excellent. So you get one of these little flowers, and every time you get one, it has this little like stick thing in it that has some instructions. Now imagine you buy this flower, and it's this pretty little rose. It's going to grow up into a beautiful bush one day. And so you get it. You pull out the little instructions, and you read it, and it says, you know, plant in fertile ground with this much room and this many hours of sunlight per day, water regularly, you know, trim off unnecessary branches. Those are your instructions. Now, we can take that and say, that is incredibly legalistic. How dare they assume what you need, little plant? I know just what you need. I'm not going to listen to those fools trying to judge you. They don't even love your little pot. Pot. I, I love you right where you are, how you are. That is the way you were made, and I love you in it. So listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to listen to those legalistic fools that gave me instructions on how I'm supposed to take care of you. I'm going to put you on my dining room table just the way you are in your little pod, the way that you were made, and I'm just going to love you, and I'm going to cherish you, and I'm going to cover you with words of affirmation. That's all you need to survive. Y'all, how's that plant going to do? It's going to die. Let's be real. It's, gonna, it's not going to make it a week. Why? Because there were specific instructions given on how it should thrive, given by its creator. You and I were created by the creator of the universe, Yahweh, God of Israel. He created us. He formed you together, knit you together in your mother's womb. He formed together every single strand of your DNA. He knows you intrinsically. He knows everything about you. He knows what it takes for you to thrive. And he knows what will cause your death. His instructions are not to manipulate you. It's not to be legalistic. It's not to force you to live the way that he wanted you to live. He just knows how you're created, and he knows how you will thrive. You see, some of the most unhappy people I've ever met in my life are the people that have everything but God. Because, listen, you can, you can spend your whole life chasing your dreams. You can, you can finally get the corner office the six-figure income, the trophy husband, trophy wife. You can get the boat, the motorcycle, the corner office. Your business can be booming. You can have everything you ever dreamt of, all the things that you thought would make you happy, all the money, all the fame, all the power. And if you don't have God, you will still be unhappy. There's a reason celebrities kill themselves every week. is because they spent their entire life chasing something they thought would make them happy, and it failed to do so. And yet, the most happy people I've ever seen in my life have absolutely nothing but a worn-out Bible. And that tells me that the creator knows what it takes for us to thrive. I'm not saying it's bad to have goals or ambitions. But it will not suit you to chase those above God. Because you will get them. Absolutely. The devil will keep whatever carrot it takes to keep you moving away from God. But even when you obtain them, they will not fulfill you. Chase God. Seek God above all else. 
then all things will be given unto you. Seek him first. Follow his instructions for life and see what happens. See, I think a lot of times we go at the concept of sin incorrectly. Sometimes we, we, we see sin in our life and we're convicted by it. The Holy Spirit convicts us we should stop doing this. Stop doing this thing. Stop being angry. Stop yelling at the kids, even though they're crazy sometimes. Right? And, you know, stop, stop looking lustfully. Um, uh, stop messing around with these people. Stop drinking. Stop doing this drug. Stop vaping. Whatever. Stop. I got to stop these things. And so we look at it and we think, all right, I'm going to stop this thing. Which absolutely, we should. But I think that we kind of look at it incorrectly. Rather than looking at what we should stop doing, why don't we focus on what we're not doing? Why don't we focus on if we're following the instructions that God has given to us? Why don't we look at our life from the outside and say, God, am I actually seeking you or am I just wearing the label of Christian? Am I actually praying? I mean, other than just for food? Am I actually reading scripture? Or am I allowed in that little... You version verse of the day to be my sustenance for the day. Am I actually seeking you? Am I spending time with your people? Am I, am I, am I putting myself and I am serving your body? Am I praising you? Am I worshiping you? Am I cherishing you? God, am I following you at all or am I wearing a label that won't save me? Because so often we wear a label that won't save us. Because Jesus didn't come and say, hey, call yourself Christian. Show up to a gathering where they give you coffee and yummy snack cakes every week. No, 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 no. The calling was follow me. Follow me. To be a Christian doesn't mean to pit on a label, vote Republican. No, it's to follow Jesus. That's the only thing that will save you. That's the only thing that will save you. And, yeah, there's a lot of people out there right now creating false gods they call Jesus. That won't save them. Only the God of Scripture, the God of this, will save you. This brings salvation. Everything else brings destruction. Follow the instructions that were given to you by the maker. See, thriving starts with following the instructions in the word of God. And so if your life doesn't look the way you wanted it to, you don't feel happy. You don't feel content. You just constantly can't shake off the feeling if you're facing storms and battles in your life. Now, listen, I'm not at all saying that following this is going to make life perfect. I don't know if you read about the martyrs in Acts. You know, sometimes it's not a great end. But I'd also, we can have hope because our hope doesn't come from this world. Yeah. We can have joy because we're not reliant on the world and the governments and the political parties and the new systems and all that. We're not reliant on those things. We rely wholly and fully on Jesus. Yeah. And thriving starts with following the instructions in God's word because God knows what is best for you. So ask yourself, am I praying? Am I studying scripture? Am I spending time with God's people? Am I pouring out? Am I, even am I giving? This isn't like a give, give to a charity or something. I'm just saying giving charitably, giving, giving uh, joyfully is a command from God, and it feels good to do. What we see here with the children of Israel is they have blatantly disobeyed God. Now they have not only for, have disobeyed God, but now they have forgotten God. They are serving the gods of the people around them, and they are intermarrying with them. Despite all these things, all the wrongs, all the mistakes, all the mess-ups, everything they had done wrong, God pours out on them over and over again his relentless grace. He pours out on them this unrelenting grace. Let me show you that in, in Judges 3, verse 9. But when they cried out to the Lord... He raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave him Cushan, Rishimathiam, uh, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until uh, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, uh, died. Here we see our first judge, Othniel. And we don't learn a whole lot about him. Now, he does incredible things. This is clear from what we read. But we actually don't learn a whole lot about him. And in fact, if you were doing like the year-long, read the Bible in one year, and you've got to read your eight chapters a day, you could very quickly miss this 50 years of Israelite history, because it happens in four verses. 
In four verses, the author recaps 50 years of history. There's eight years of servitude. There is 40 years of peace. 48, close enough. It's very easy to miss. So what this kind of tells me is, we're going to see in just a moment again with a few other judges, that perhaps the focus of judges isn't on the judges. Maybe the hero of the story is not actually the men, but the God that's behind them. You see, what we see with Othniel here is we see a pattern that is going to be repeated over and over and over again through each judge, through each time period in history. So during this 50 years, we've seen that the people sinned and they rebelled against God. They sinned and they rebelled against God. Then they are oppressed by their enemy. They cry out to God and God sends a deliverer. It's almost like this story is pointing us to something else, something bigger, something else that is to come. It's one thing that I've loved as we studied through the Old Testament is every single story points to Jesus. Here, we're going to see this pattern through every single judge. When Israel cries out, God sends a deliverer. One day, the people cried out and God sent a deliverer for the entire world. And his name was Jesus. And he laid down his life so the entire world could be delivered from sin. The story is pointing to him. What we see over and over and over again is God show his relentless grace. That God is the hero. He never tires of his people. And despite their sin, despite their brokenness, despite their imperfection, despite every time they have fallen and they have failed, he answers their call every time they repent and cry out to him. Let's look at the next story. At the end of this 40 years of peace, we see the story of a man named Ehud. So our second judge we're going to look at is Ehud. He has an interesting story. Verse 12. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. So again, we see the cycle repeat itself. The Israelites, they, they rebel against God, and immediately um, they, they are infiltrated and uh, oppressed by another group, another enemy. And so the common way that they would be oppressed or beaten in this day is that the opposing kingdom would simply come into their, their town, their city, wherever they're at, and they would just start to kill people. I mean, pretty gruesomely kill people. Not necessarily, didn't, I mean, they're obviously opposing soldiers. There would be a fight. But they would come and kill you until you surrendered. And then once you surrendered, you would have to pay a tribute price so that they don't kill you anymore. It's an interesting system. Seemed effective. And so what happened here is that the Moabites, led by Eglon, uh, came and forced Israel to surrender. And now Israel has to pay a tribute price to Eglon, which this tribute block price was always extreme, extremely huge. It was probably the majority of their crops, the majority of their livestock, the majority of their gold. It, it, was, it was the majority of the things they had. And so they were always forced into this barely being able to make it situation. And so they were kind of between a rock and a hard place. Either they pay Eglon or they die, or they pay Eglon and then they might still die from starvation. It just really depends how it went. They were under the rule of Eglon for over 18 years. Then read what happens. Verse 15. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Moab. We see the, the pattern repeat itself, and we see another deliverer has been given to them. This time we get a man named Ehud, and we learn one thing about him. He's left-handed. Now, some translations uh, say that he, he uh, was unable to use his right hand. Uh, so some scholars believe that either he was born with a deformed right hand, or his right hand was injured, or he was just left-handed dominant. We don't know. But either way, the point is that he had to prominently or you know, primarily use his left hand, which in this time was an extremely rare thing. If you think, uh, I know I have, a, I have a few friends that are lefties, and, and they'll tell me that this is a right-handed world from like every, everything uh, available, from the way pants are made. It is a right-handed world. Um, if you think of it in this time, it was 100 times worse than that. Uh, being left-handed was thought of as a disability, as a weakness. Uh, in fact, uh, Jewish mothers would swat the hand of their child if they tried to use their left hand to eat or, or work or do anything with. And so at this time, it was thought of as a disability, as a weakness that Ehud would have had, which is not surprising to me at all that that is who God chose to use, someone that to man would look weak. So what Ehud does is he actually crafts for himself 
a blade that is a cubit long, so it's 18 inches. A, a blade that is 18 inches long, and he fixes it on his right thigh so that he could draw. At this point in time, you'd have to, I mean, if you carry a sword, you'd have to cross draw because it's very ineffective to try to draw it straight up. You don't have uh, that long of a reach. And so you would cross draw, but it was on his right thigh, which is where people weren't used to looking. Um, and so keep that in mind as he brings his tribute to Eglon, who from my study is the only person in all of scripture that the Bible refers to as very fat. I, I know, I know. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. All right, Judges 3.17. Let's read. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. I, just, I would let the Bible say it that time. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. So right there, that took in a company of men to carry the tribute. It was so large. And so Ehud sent them away. Verse 19, but on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, leave us. And they all left. And so now, I just, this is where my brain goes, guys. I, I, um, I try to think of the, the Bible visually. And so at this moment, when we see Eglon before Ehud, we see them facing off. I just, you, you guys remember Star Wars where you have Han facing off against like Jabba the Hutt? Do y'all remember that scene? Okay. Uh, well, look it up when you get home. This is what I picture in my head when I see the scene. Now listen what, what, what transpires here. Verse 20. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand and drew the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. It's fun. Ehud did not pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind him. And lock them. Now we could do a very youth ministry message with this, but I'm going to spare you guys that because I think you'll remember it well enough. But if you can imagine for a moment, Ehud, this left handed man, we don't know again if his hand is, is messed up or whatever, but he's left handed. And evidently that allows him to conceal an 18 inch blade into the king's palace room. He says, I have a message for you from God. Yeah, it's like straight out of a movie. Like I feel like Russell Crowe's playing him and just, you know. And, and we see uh, this next scene where it says his bowels discharged. Just, just remember that for me. Um, because what happens is Ehud does what he needs to do. He locks the door and he leaves. Walks out casually. It says that the servants go back to the door to check on the king and find the door is locked. And they assume he is relieving himself. I'm a, I don't think it's a coincidence the bowel discharging and relieving himself are in the same passage here. I just, I'm assuming there's a reason they think that. And so what they do is they wait, not to interrupt the king relieving himself. And they wait, the Bible actually says, an embarrassingly long time. I don't know what that was in this day, but whatever that amount of time was, was enough time that Eglon, or, or I'm sorry, Ehud could get back to his Israelite army and prepare them for battle. Because with the Moabite king slaughtered, he prepared the children of Israel to go and encounter the Moabite army as they were crossing the Jordan. Now, we know from whenever they made their way into the promised land, there's very few places that the Jordan is actually crossable. So they found a place that probably that the, the Moabite army had to cross, and they strategically set themselves up there. And it says that day they slayed 10,000 Moabite soldiers. So God led them into deliverance. And we see... For the longest period, uh, we see the longest period of peace uh, in the book of Judges right here. They have peace for 80 years after this. But the pattern shall repeat itself. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, what can we learn from the story of Ehud and Eglon? First, search your enemies better. And second, don't ever think what man says disqualifies you disqualifies you. Because Ehud may have spent his entire life thinking that he was weak. He may have spent his entire life thinking that he wasn't good enough, he wasn't strong enough, he wasn't, it wasn't what, what they needed. In, in fact, we can, we can maybe assume that Ehud wasn't even a soldier to be allowed into the king's palace like this. Ehud may have spent his entire life thinking he was disqualified for service for God. And I think that a lot of us spend our entire life thinking the same thing. 
that we are disqualified for service for God because of my past, because of my mistakes, because of the who I am, because of the addictions I, I have, because of the, 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 the life that I'm living. We may spend our entire life thinking we are disqualified from God using us. But as I said before, he can do incredible things with a simple yes. We see Ehud. We're in a moment we're going to see with Shamgar. God uses who you don't expect. So let's go and talk about our next guy. The final judge we're going to look at today is a gentleman named Shamgar. He has an incredibly uh, long passage about him. It's one verse. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Poor guy. I'm telling you. Like the man struck down 600 Philistines. Now, for reference, Samson, the, the mighty warrior we'll read out in a few weeks, struck down Philistines. They were known to be a, an incredibly uh, strong army. They were known to be warriors. Uh, Goliath was a Philistine. They were known to be incredible warriors. And yet we see right here, Shamgar struck down 600 of them with an ox goad. Now listen, we are not given any more information. I don't know if this is in like one, one moment, like one fight, he just went off and like slayed a bunch of Philistines with what he had in hand, or if this is over the course of years. We, 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 had, we don't have that information. But what we do know is that he slayed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. An ox goad isn't even a weapon. An ox goad is an eight foot long stick that has a hook for cleaning out the chariot wheels and has a, has a pointy end to poke the ox if it quits moving. It's a farming tool. And so at least from the best of our, our knowledge, from what we can tell about Shamgar, he wasn't a warrior, he was a farmer. And yet God used him right where he was with the tools he had in hand. So many of us think that if we're ever going to serve God, we've got to become a pastor, we've got to go to seminary, we've got to get everything right, everything in order, everything under control, and then God will use us. We see with Shamgar right here, he uses a farmer with what he has in hand. He use, he'll use you with whatever you have in hand, with whatever you give up to him. He will use whatever you have. And I know that so many of us say, well, I don't have much to offer God. Good, that's all he needs. If you don't think God can do a lot with a little bit, just ask that little boy who had two loaves of bread and five fish. Amen. Right? Ask, ask that bride and groom, all they had was 12 barrels of water. Ask Gideon what God can do with just a few men. Ask Abraham what God can do with just a little bit of faith. Look at scripture. Look at what the men of God, look at what the judges had to offer. God can do incredible things with just a little bit. And God will do incredible things with just a little bit if we'll give that little bit to him. Amen. We may spend our whole life saying, I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I can't make it. I'm not strong enough. I'm not mighty enough. I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know the Bible. I don't. We can come up with all sorts of excuses of why we can't serve God. But every single one of them is null and void if you simply say yes. Yes. I'll tell you a story as I wrap up. We were going to the lake last week, uh, and I was doing my, my fatherly duties. I was packing up the cooler, uh, and Shep was there with me. He's my little two-year-old. Uh, and I was packing up the cooler. Got it all packed up. Got it full of ice, drinks, uh, sandwich stuff. And I was about to go pick it up, and he, uh, he looked at me, and he said, I carry, I carry. And, and I'm like, you can't carry it, son. It's heavy. It's bigger than you are. And he insisted that he could carry it. I knew he could not carry it, but I allowed him to try so he walks up, he grabs the handle, it's like taller than he is, and he like yeah, tugs on it. Absolutely, can't move it, can't budge it. And so then he looks at me like it's my fault that he can't carry it. And he says, help! I'm like, okay, I guess I will. And I grab it, and I pick it up like I'm going to carry it away. And then I feel his hand right next to mine. And he continues to carry it alongside me. And he grunts like he's really doing something, even though he let it go three times. And he carries it with me all the way to the car. And we put it away in the car. You see, I was his father, and I knew that he couldn't carry it. I was just waiting for him to cry out. You see, God is a good, good father. And I know that you're facing things in your life right now that are too big for you to carry yourself. You're facing situations that may seem too dark. They may seem unbeatable. You may be in the midst of being beaten right now at this moment. And you're saying, God, I can't carry it. He is a good, good father. And if you would just cry out to him, Father, help. He will. 
Because there are things in this life that you were never meant to handle alone. There are things you were never meant to go through alone. There are challenges and battles and things that will come over you in this life that you were never meant to handle alone. And God knows that. That's why we see the repetition. He just waits for his children to cry out. And when they cry out to him, he delivers them from their problem. That same promise wasn't just there for the Israelites back then. It's there for you here today. That if you will cry out to God, he will save you. Now that may not look like what you expect it to look like. So often the solutions of God don't. But he will deliver you. And as we see in Romans 8, 28, he will work all things together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He will work together all things. And so many people may stand here today and say, I don't, I don't deserve it, Jeff. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't deserve to cry out to God. You don't understand the things I've done, the mistakes I've made, the stuff I'm doing right now. When I leave here, you don't know what's going to happen. What I know is Romans 5.8, it says that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. He didn't wait for you to be perfect. He didn't wait for you to have it all together, and there's not a thing that you can do, have done, or will do that will shock him. He knew every sin. He knew every mistake. He knew everything that you would do, and he laid his life down, and he died for it. You see, we were delivered. When the Son of God lived a perfect, sinless life, because you couldn't, because you couldn't, because you would rebel, you would fall, you would break, and you would, be, uh, you would be judged, and you would be found guilty of sin and suffering and death. The Son of God came and lived a perfect, sinless life. And he went on the cross and he paid for your sins once and for all. Every mistake, every problem, every sin, every addiction has been nailed to the cross. It is paid for. To tell us die means paid in full. All you have to do is cry out. Romans 10, 9 says, if you say with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Christ is Lord and that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. You don't have the answers? Cry out to him. You don't have the solution? Cry out to him. The problem before you is too big? Cry out to him. You have no idea who he is but you know that this life is too hard for you to do on your own, cry out to him. You feel the Holy Spirit telling you right now that your life isn't going the way that it should be going. You're not living the way that you should be living. Cry out to him. I just want to take a moment with every head bowed and every eye closed. I came to this church nine years ago. I knew nothing about God. I knew the, the Easter story and the Christmas story. That was it. I didn't know what a chapter or a verse was. But God changed everything in my life from a simple yes. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, sure, you're in Tennessee, part of the Bible Belt, you know of Jesus, but you don't know him. You want to make that decision today to say, to say that I will follow you, Jesus. I am yours. If that's you and you want to make that decision today, I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible tells us that if you just say with your mouth and you believe in your heart that he is Lord, then you are saved. That is an absolute definitive thing. You are saved. If that's you and you want to make that decision, on the count of three, I want you to raise up your hand and you can put it back down. It's not that there's any power in raising your hand, but I believe that an outward affirmation of what's happening inwardly absolutely makes a difference. So if that's you and you want to make that decision, on the count of three, raise your hand and I'll have you pray with me. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. Incredible. I believe those of you that raise your hand are about to pray this prayer. Your life will never be the same. And right now, after you pray this prayer and you give your life to Jesus, your hope no longer relies in this world and the political leaders of this world, but it lies only and solely in God. So if you would, join me in prayer. If you'd like to make this decision to follow Jesus. Say, Jesus... Today, I give you my everything. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died for my sin. And I believe you rose from the dead. Jesus, today, I turn away from my sins and I pursue you to the best of my ability. Jesus, I am yours. I will seek you and follow your instructions.
Jesus, I am yours. Amen. If you prayed that and you meant it, I believe as we read a few weeks ago in Revelation, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Eternity with God is yours. So your hope is no longer in this world or the wars or politicians or any other crazy thing that happens on this, this side of existence. Your hope is now in Jesus alone. Let me pray for you real quick just as a body and then we're gonna stand up and praise Jesus for a little while. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for everything you do for us and you do through us. God, I just pray that you'd be with each and every person here. God, you know the battles, the temptations, the addictions. You know what's happening in this room right now. And God, we need you. No matter where we're at, what we're going through, God, we need you. We need your Holy Spirit to be present in our life. We need your Holy Spirit to lead and guide and convict us, Lord. We need you here today, Lord. Just be with each and every person here, Father. I lift them up to you, that you would walk with them, that you would teach them, that you would show them the right way to follow you, the way to thrive, Father. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.